Welcome back, ladies and gents. On today's show, Ford teases a flying Bronco, Nicola gets a shock from the SEC, and the Mini Moke returns. Plus, we talk to an expert about what it takes to import a foreign car and look at the cars we pick to import first. I'm Tiffany Stone, and this is Haggerty's Daily Driver. Let's buckle up. If you like the new Bronco but wish it were part airplane, you might be in luck. Ford posted this photo of a test mule flying high above terra firma, all but confirming plans to give their new SUV some Raptor DNA. Haggerty spy photographers have seen a similar truck before, sporting beefier tires and a taller ride than other Bronco test mules. And as with the Raptor before it, Ford is making sure its newest off-roader can handle the abuse. It looks like the front lower control arms on this flying horse are bigger than those on the regular Bronco. The existence of this truck should be surprising to no one. First, the full-size Raptor has been a money printing machine for Ford. Second, the Ranger Raptor has the whole internet hungry for a buy it now button. And lastly, some of the original Bronco's credibility came from its success in various off-road races. Come on guys, Ford would be so stupid not to sell a Baja ready Bronco, especially when that's something Jeep doesn't currently offer. So will it be called the Bronco Raptor? Maybe not. Ford recently submitted a patent application for the name Warthog. What do you guys think about that name? Let us know in the comments down below. Speaking of high flyers, the stock price of electric truck company Nikola surged last week after GM announced they were buying a $2 billion stake in the startup. Nikola is known for its promises to revolutionize the semi-truck industry by using electricity or hydrogen instead of diesel fuel. Its website advertises trucks with powerful motors, long range ability, and ultra fast charging. Impressive, right? Well, this week their sales are losing a bit of air. On September 10th, two days after the GM announcement, short seller Hindenburg Research published a scathing report saying Nikola landed the GM deal from, quote, an ocean of lies. Hindenburg said they have extensive evidence to support their claims and have never seen this level of deception at a public company of this size. One of the most interesting things brought to light involved this video of Nikola One driving down a two-lane road. It's a truck driving down the road. What's the big deal? Well, it's not really driving per se. A former Nikola employee allegedly told Hindenburg that this truck was not moving under its own power. It was just rolling down a hill in neutral. <laughs> that's a pretty big claim and... Oh, well that's awkward. Good thing tractor trailers never have to go uphill. Nikola has denied the rest of Hindenburg's accusations, but this whole thing has made so much noise that the SEC and the Department of Justice are looking into it. And if you're a publicly traded company, or any company, that's a bad thing. This is the business equivalent of being called into the principal's office to find your parents already sitting there. Yikes. <laughs> On the opposite side of the serious coin, ever seen one of these? It's a mini moke. Maybe you saw one zipping around a beach town and thought, oh, how adorable. Someone built a Willys Jeep golf cart for $50. But these were originally designed to be used in the military. Thinking it looks a little bit low to the ground compared to a Jeep? Well, you're right. The ground clearance and small wheels were problematic in rough terrain, and the moke was discharged and sent back to civilian life. But hey, I don't want to get stuck in the past. They've been very popular transportation in the Caribbean and other sunny places, but now Moke International wants to expand their reach. They're now on sale in the UK for around 23000 It has a roll cage, but no windows or doors, so secure your phone and body before you take off. There's a one liter gas engine under the cute little hood, making 68 horsepower. That will get this open aired picnic basket to 68 miles per hour, which I would totally do, even if it would give my mom a heart attack. Sorry, mom. Good news though, you can apparently order an electric power moke in the US now, but the gas powered one won't be here until 2021. Coming up on open diffs, have you ever wanted to import a car, but don't know how to do it? or even what you're allowed to bring in. Well, you're in luck. Haggerty's own Andrew Newton talked to Ryan Offenharts of AI Design, who has brought countless cool cars into the US. They talk about how it works and what's on their shopping list. But first. Bronco Sports Utility, a do-anything workhorse. Bronco Wagon, family carry-all. 
name of Bronco, a new V8 Bronco at your Ford dealer. Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching Open Diffs. I'm Andrew Newton. I'm the auction editor at Haggerty. I'm here with Ryan Offenharts of AI Design up in New York, and he's an expert on importing cars. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about today is importing cars, the process, some um, cool stuff coming down the pipeline. And specifically, we're talking about cars that you couldn't get here when they were new, but eventually they get old enough where they become exempt from some of our uh, pesky rules and regulations. And we'll talk about some specific cars that are coming up on that age limit. But uh, before we do that, Ryan, um, especially the last few years with the big growth in the market for JDM cars, we hear the term 25 year rule thrown around a lot. Um, what, what exactly does that mean? Why do we, why do we have it? Why do we have to live with it? Uh, so after 25 years, there are no federal regulations. So they all expire at 25 years, DOT, EPA, um, and at which point you can import just about anything you want. Right. And then, especially the last few years, it's been cool stuff from late 80s, early 90s, Japan. Right. right. So we're starting to get into stuff that, that was actually cool. I mean, stuff from the 80s wasn't really that interesting besides like 959s, things like that out of Germany. But, you know, the Japanese car scene got really awesome in the mid 90s. Totally. And then there's you know some funky stuff from Europe coming out of the 90s too, um, and some oddballs. But if we turn back the clock a little bit, you know we're already in mid-September now, so we're coming up on 2021, and um, that means 1996, the class of 96. So is there anything you're looking forward to that's on your wish list that uh, we're gonna see in the next few months? Uh, I have some oddball stuff that I'm I'm interested in. I know I know you had a list as well. Um, yeah. One of the things that's just started to come up now would be like a Fiat Barchetta. I know it's not out of Japan, but that's a I've always liked yeah. those. I always like <laughs> I have a weird, um, a weird thing for that. Yeah, um, really the WRXs good. as well. So like the the V Limited WRXs, um, they were a '96 car. Although I think some of them started being built in '95, so you could technically import something by its first registration date. So if it had a registration date of September 1995, I could import it now. Yeah, that's a good point too. It's not it's not like, you know, January 1st rolls around and then you can automatically import everything from that right. year. It's, it's from the uh, registration date or the build date? It's the build date, but the easiest way usually to prove a build date is um, with a registration. So if I can provide a registration gotcha. um, to the port that says this was registered in September 1995, it would have had to have been built prior to that. Okay. So I usually go by registration dates when I import cars. Gotcha. Um, like the one I'm sitting in right now was first registered in July 1994. It's an RS2 wagon. Cool. So. I was just going to ask you, what are you sitting in? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in an 800 horsepower RS2. So, <laughs> pretty <perfect>. cool car. <laughs> uh, you mentioned WRXs. Uh, another one that came out in 96 is the Lancer Evolution 4. Uh, it's BC yep. Evo 4. And that, that's a cool one. Um, it's got the the World Rally Championship pedigree, uh, won, the, won the Drivers' Championship, I think. And uh, that was the first one with active yaw control. So that one right. didn't come out until late 96, I think. So you have right. to wait a bit on that one, but that one's cool. Um, another another JDM one that I think I'm looking forward to is uh, the R33 GTR uh, LM Limited version. Yep. Um, so we've, we've had R33s here already for a little bit now, and there are quite a few over here, but the LM Limited was like this, uh, they built it briefly in the spring. I think they only built 188 of them. They were all this nice uh, championship blue color, and car didn't win at Le Mans, but they went racing there with it, and it was kind of a celebration of that. And from a collectability standpoint, that's, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, for Skylines in general, we're heading into an era of really awesome Skylines. Um, yes. But I think the prices on those are going to quickly run ahead of the import. So that's the same thing happened with the RS2s, um, which I, I brought three of those in. And the prices had already gone up by the time they were importable. You know, at, at 23 years, they were already peaking. So I think you're going to see that with Skylines. How often do you see it where people know a car is about to turn 25, it's about to be eligible? Do people look ahead to that and start shopping like six months? or Yeah. Or yeah, I do that often. This car I bought six months before it was importable uh, okay. for the client, and then I stashed it in Germany with somebody that I know. 
Um, and of, actually, of all three of the RS2s I brought in, they were all bought at least three months prior to being eligible for import. Gotcha. And then you just keep it over there and then count down the days. Yeah, either keep it if the seller's nice enough to keep it there, but I also have um, people I work with in Germany that'll hold the car for me. Gotcha. Um, back to individual cars, I think another one, uh, I, I, put a, I put together a list for a, an article on Haggerty.com. And the first one for me was the Series 1 Lotus Elise. That's one I'm you know, pretty excited about. We got the, that car's uh, awesome. We got the second generation one here in 2005, but the first one dates back way back to 96, and it was like a new car showing off this uh, cool bonded aluminum chassis, but it was also a throwback to Lotus from the 60s, you know, the small bare bones uh, little roadster. And I think that resonated with a lot of people is why it became that model. Oh yeah, successful. for sure. That's cool. And um, it has a totally it was a definitely a departure too from like the Esprit. Um, yeah. Was, I, especially by the mid nineties, the Esprit had turned into something that was not very Lotus like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, they had the front wheel drive Elan, which was, you know, a big failure. And the Elise was um, really a return to form for them. And the, yeah. First ones have a totally different look from the later ones. They have a different engine. So uh, it's it's a different car in a lot of ways. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing some. Yeah, no, those are really those are really awesome. Uh, another one, I'm a, I'm a British car guy. So I had to put a, a TVR on my list. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's one of those cars that like, you dream about it and you think it's so cool and it may not even be that expensive, but like the idea of actually owning it is, is really daunting. So uh, the TVR Cerbero is one of those for me. Um, it's like, there are a lot of horror stories about um, like engines needing a rebuild after 15 or 20,000 miles. And they like rust in weird places where you can't even- They have weird it. chassis corrosion problems for sure. Right. <laughs> um, and then like, once you actually get it over here, like how, who are you gonna find to work on your proprietary TVR engine. <laughs> well, that's where a lot of stuff comes to us at AI Design because we'll, we'll work on just about anything. Okay, but I'll come to you. Uh, the biggest problem is just finding them and finding the right one and having someone you trust, especially right now with COVID, it's pretty hard to travel. So you're not going to fly to England. Yeah. So, um, But those cars have like the coolest interior, I think. Yeah. At least in the yeah. 90s. And um, they sound amazing, and I, I just like the idea of them, but I shudder at the thought of actually owning one. But, uh, yeah, owning and maintaining them. Even more mainstream cars, um, JDM cars, I have some key cars. Um, mm -hmm. They're pretty hard to get parts for. If you need like a, a body panel or a headlight or a clutch line, it's almost impossible. You have to make it or order it from Japan and wait three months. So <laughs> they have a lot of money for it, right? Right. So that, that's a big problem in general. So I would be very nervous with a TVR because there probably isn't a part. <laughs> but, exactly. uh, another, another oddball for me was the uh, Renault Sport Spider, which uh, is almost like a French version of the Lotus Elise. Uh, I think they made like 1,800 of these things. Um, you've got seats, a roll bar, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you had to pay extra for a windshield and, and a radio. And um, I think a few of them have come into Canada already. And I guess that's another thing we could touch on is that Canada has a basically a, a similar rule to us, but they're 10 years ahead. They're rule of the 15, 15 years. Yeah. They have a 25 year rule. So when I mean, you run into that, into that a lot where you're bringing cars from Canada? I don't myself, um, but I do know some cars that have gone through Canada. Um, the car I'm sitting next to uh, came from Canada first and it's actually a, uh, gray market car that got federalized. So it's a RS4 Avant, a 2001. Okay. So there, that seems to be the more, the cars I see from Canada seem to be more of those. Um, there's a company in Arizona that federalized a bunch of Audi wagons and they all came from Canada first. He brought them into Canada, staged them there and then went through the process because it's a much lengthier process to federalize a car. Um, okay, so it's a similar process up there to? Well, no, to, to, to make a car that was never federalized that's younger than 25 years to try to pass it through the u.s is a much lengthier process so he was staging them in canada so the cars that i've seen from canada are usually those they're newer cars um there were some rs6 wagons some rs4 wagons um some amg wagons so um and i guess as far as the process goes um 
there are tons of like potential issues and pitfalls. And I guess there's sort of three ways you can do it, right? You can do it all yourself. Which you yeah. shouldn't do. Yeah. Well, the, do all, try to do all the paperwork and just crush fingers and hope that everything goes right. You could go through like a, go through a broker and, you know, maybe shop for the car, but pay somebody to kind of do the legwork for you. Or there's like all these dealers that have popped up that pretty much specialize in getting these cars, bringing them over here, federalizing them, you're getting them um, right. approved, and then they'll sell it to you directly. Um, exactly. What are the, uh, what are the issues with each and what would you actually recommend? Well, doing it yourself, unless you're an expert and a gambler, you definitely shouldn't do. Yeah. Um, Cause it's really easy to just get completely ripped off for one. Cause you're going to have to wire money at some point to Japan or Germany or Slovakia um, and hope that your car comes to you eventually. Uh, so I, I would really suggest not doing that unless you just want to gamble. Um, the middle version with the broker probably gets you the best of both worlds because they're not trying to sell you a car that they already have. Um, they're just trying to find you the best car. Uh, or if you find one, they can help you secure it, keep it secure, pay for it securely, um, do all that. And then on the, on the dealer side, it's the easiest process. The car's just going to show up at your house, but you know, you're probably buying something that's already been imported that they already picked that they're making money on. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be the most expensive. It's probably going to be the most expensive and it's still a gamble to me. I just, you know, you don't know what, how they are importing them. How are they vetting them? Did they go to Japan and look at them? Yeah. Um, you know, if they're just buying them off an online auction in Japan, you might as well just gamble yourself and buy them. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of dealers. So I would definitely research the dealer. They were do the last couple of years. True. It seems like there's 10 times more dealers now. Um, so it sounds like for the average person, you probably recommend option B. I would recommend option B. Um, that's what, what I, well, I, when I offer that service, so I find that that's the best, but I, yeah. I just also think that it's the, I like the broker idea in general. Um, I've worked at car dealers before, before I worked here. And I just, I think the broker, they're not trying to sell you one car. They want to sell you the right car. And that's what they're in the business of doing. How, uh, how did you get into this segment of the hobby? <laughs> as importing cars yeah um i actually started because i had a client who wanted a car <laughs> so i had to figure out how to do it i get it um and they trusted me they wanted me to handle it so i got into into it that way um years ago i dabbled in it uh like 2003 i built a built a nissan and i had to import a uh, r33 skyline motor and i imported the whole front of the car but it still had a vin number attached to it so that was a six month battle with customs so uh, that's where I learned you can really get in some trouble. Yeah. This, sound, this sounds like an exercise in patience. Uh, yes. Times, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's lots of patience and, and COVID's only made it harder with, you know, yeah, I, I had a car that was supposed to import for April 1st, um, another Audi wagon. And I stopped it from being imported and I told the seller to hold it and we didn't bring it in until July because I was nervous of it getting stuck in a port somewhere. You know, if they start shutting down ports and it was in a port when I, you know, I got a almost six figure wagon stuck in a miscellaneous port and I can't call anybody. So, you know, you have to be really cautious now and kind of follow world news. What's going on in the country you're importing it from. Is that getting better? It's getting better now. Yeah. Like right now I don't see any problems, but I still, you know, if I, if I bought a car out of Italy, I would really dive into what's going on in Italy, local lockdowns, anything like that. And just be sure. Okay. In, uh, in sort of normal times, are there specific countries or regions that are easier than others? There's no region I don't think that's easier than others. Um, there are certain ones that you can, like if you buy a car out of Germany that is registered and on the road and it, it's gotta be a pretty good car. They have really strict road laws. It'd be the same thing out of, out of England if it had an MOT, like a, you know, a recent MOT, it, the, the chances of it being a total you know, bad car is, is really, wow. really low. So that, you know, um, I, when you start buying from odd places, you know, if you wanted to buy from some, I don't know, I don't know some country that doesn't have really strict laws. I can't think of one, maybe South America somewhere, you know, you might not, who knows what you're buying. Right. So, but yeah, as far as importing and bringing to the U S there's no real difference as far as I've seen. Okay. Most of the, so most of the hard part is the American side of it, the American side of it. And that's why the, 
I, without a registration date or like a piece from the manufacturer that says this car was manufactured on X date, I don't, I wouldn't even try to import a car. Okay. Interesting. So, right, that's why I, I prefer the registration. You know, if I can have the first registration date, that's easy. They, that'll fly right through custom. You pay your two and a half percent tax and it comes right in. Gotcha. Okay. And, um, I hear you're into the Japanese K cars also. <laughs> I've, I've gotten some myself. I bought some through, um, through a good reputable dealer that I researched for other clients. Um, they're great. They're fun little cars. Yeah. Um, I like them too. Uh, I heard you have a Honda Beat. Also. I do. Okay, yeah. I love those. Um, I've, I've bid on a few on my, on bring a trailer and I have never pulled, actually pulled the trigger, but I love them. They're so cool. I, uh, I love the car, but I did have, um, I had a really big problem getting tires for it because the front wheels are 13 inch and the backs are 14 inch. So finding a matching set of four tires <laughs> was next to impossible in the U S I almost broke down and ordered them from Japan. Um, but then one, they wouldn't have had DOT and I would have ended up paying like $2,000 for tires on a $7,000 car. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's the, and it, I didn't know the tires were old when I brought it in. Right. I just, it just was part of buying the car and they were all dry rotted and 10 year old tires. So you've got the RS2 wagon that you're sitting in right now. Um, yep. Are you bringing anything else cool in? I'm looking right now for Delta Integrale Evo 2s. Um, I have a couple okay. clients looking for those, which obviously they're a pretty rare car anyways. <laughs> so, And I've dealt with some of them and they tend to be uh, a little worn out. They were, you know, so it's really hard to find a good example. And then getting parts for those is really difficult. Sure. So, Believe it. but that, that's what's currently on my docket. Um, and then for next year, um, starting in the summer, I'm going to be looking for uh, S6 plus Avance, the last of the C4 chassis wagons. So the, the V8 okay. manual awesome. in the plus trim, which we never had. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks for, thanks for talking with us, Ryan. Uh, sure. Appreciate Anytime. It. And, thanks uh, for having me. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Andrew and Ryan, for that. I know I'll be watching the calendar closely. And that's all for today, but I'll be back next week with more car news. But until then, keep driving.